You had the option today, well, way back at the beginning of the semester, to choose between two readings. The other reading that we could have looked at today was uh, a chapter of a book by Alan Watts, who I'm sure you've heard of. He's got a bunch of lectures on YouTube. He's dead now. Um, but he tried to bring Eastern philosophy to Western audiences. And he was trying to explain all of these ancient Eastern traditions and philosophies to Western people who had never really heard or considered them before. Things like Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism. One of the main features of Eastern schools of thought is that they teach you that if you want to get along well in this life, you should cultivate detachment from reality. Not hanging so strongly on to things. Not expecting too much out of your life. Not getting too invested in the events in your life. But cultivating some sort of an ability to flow with the events of life. Not ruminating on them, but taking them as they come. And when they leave, saying goodbye without much of a thought. In contrast to this, there's a way of going about living life that involves more effort and more attachment to the things that matter to you, to events in your life, to relationships. We're looking at a philosophy today that prescribes a kind of attachment like that. And in that way, it's more Western than it is Eastern. Which makes sense because the philosopher that we're looking at today is writing within the Western philosophical tradition. She's a French philosopher. And what she's arguing in this book is that if we can get love right, and if we, if we can act out love properly, and if we can change our language around sex and love, we're all going to be a lot better off. And so she prescribes a kind of attachment towards life, loving other people, which necessarily involves investing in them in a some sense, in some sense, right? Hanging on to them in some sense. Though as we'll see, she's not about revolving around people. She doesn't think that's healthy. But love, in contrast to detachment or going with the flow, it unites. It doesn't just separate you from what there is. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about love and how to love people properly. Because as a philosophy of life, Arigurai thinks that love is one of the things that is going to be, that is going to allow us to basically turn our society around, if we can get it right. So let me give you some background on this book generally and Arigurai's philosophy generally before we get into what she's saying in these two chapters. One of the things that she notes in this book, I love to you, is that Western society is subject-object oriented, and that this is a problem. What do you think she means when she says that how we conceptualize things and how we act in Western society and how society is organized is subject-object oriented? What do you think she means? many different ways to answer this question because this way of viewing and being in the world is central to how we do things in the West. It's central to scientific pursuits. It's central in how we understand our relationships with other people. It's central to how we organize our economic system.
Anybody got an idea? Could we value things and we work our lives around things to get them? That's certainly a part of it, yeah. That is one of the primary ways that we organize and go about living our lives, right? We treat ourselves as a subject, as someone with goals, desires, and we treat other things within our perceptual field as objects, including other people, right? When you're working your job, you don't treat the customers that come up to you as someone who is transcendent to your ways of understanding and categorizing the world. You place them in a box so you can interact with them in a way that is efficient and smooth, and so you don't really have to deal with their unique individuality, right? Your boss treats you like an object in certain respects. Your boss isn't interested in hearing your sob story about what happened to you this weekend, right? Your boss wants you to be an efficient worker, and as such, treats you and thinks of you in a certain way, as an object to getting some sort of end accomplished, namely selling a product or keeping the store in business, whatever it is. This way of seeing and acting within the world also extends to how we engage in research in our scientific pursuits. We see the world as a collection of objects that we can understand if we just analyze them carefully enough and long enough, right? But there is a weakness at the heart of viewing the world this way and acting this way in our lives. And that is, other people are not objects. They cannot be objects. Other people are transcendent to our ways of knowing and understanding the world. Other people always have the capacity to surprise us. And they don't fit neatly within the little boxes and categories that we use to understand what the heck all of this is, right? This is central to a rigorized thought. She thinks that what is needed for us to turn society around, for us to lead fulfilling lives, is a new language and a new way of relating to other people which doesn't seek to dominate or control them. Or completely categorize them. Our current ways of seeing the world, of acting in the world, of relating to other people, are ways in which, and our language is like this too, they're based around domination and control, around categorization, of trapping the world into models, in boxes, in numbers, so that we can move things around more efficiently, and so that we can produce things more efficiently, right? But this way of linguistically communicating with others and of relating to other people is inherently lacking because it does not admit of their own transcendence as a being who has a unique subjectivity which you cannot permeate. And so what Arigarai is generally arguing in this book is that we need a new language and we need a new way of relating to other people if we're going to actually make the change that we want to see in the world. Her primary focus in this book is on love because she sees that our language surrounding love and sex and relationships fits into this dominating and controlling mode rather than a more respectful, uh, philosophical mold, you might say. In this book, one of her central ideas, in addition to this, is that neither males nor females in human society are whole. There is a fundamental difference between them. They're not the same thing. 
and that each individual must work into growing into the person they're meant to be through honest, open relationship with others. There is a tendency within our society, within our language, within our culture, to reduce people to some sort of particular instantiation of a universal humanity. We're all the same thing, ultimately. We all have the same desires, the same wishes. This is not respectful, respectful of who we are as individuals or as sexed beings. Rather, there is a fundamental difference between people and more specifically, there's a fundamental difference between the sexes. And that difference needs to be recognized and respected if we're going to cultivate fulfilling relationships with others. And if we're going to make society better than it is right now. If we want to live a fulfilling, happy life, we need to work at becoming the person that we're supposed to be by cultivating relationships with other people. Because as we've seen in the ethics of care, relationships are the ground stuff of society. And we would not be here if it was not for relationships. Now, Arigarai is coming from a distinct school of philosophy. She's very Hegelian in her thought. She's very inspired by the philosopher of Hegel. We're not really going to touch on that aspect of her philosophy here. If you did understand what Hegel's about and how he understood what we're all doing in society and through the evolution of the universe and through consciousness, you'd have a better understanding of why she's saying what she's saying here but we don't need to know that in order to understand her central points in this piece, I do not think. So let's actually talk about that. What does she say in chapters 9 and 10 in this book? Well, the first thing that must be mentioned is that she has a particular conception of what it means to be a person. And therefore, how we ought to treat other people and the kinds of language that we should use when we are building relationships with others and when we're addressing them. In philosophy, there is a basic conception that underlies a lot of people's thoughts that I think would be helpful to introduce to you here. This is the distinction between self and other. What you are is a self to you, right? You have your own mind, you have your own desires, your own beliefs, you're living in a body, maybe your body is you in some sense. And so you see the world from a particular standpoint. You understand what's going on in here, this is a part of you, this is an extension of you. But everything that is not a part of you, that is not a part of yourself, is other. It is in some sense strange to you. It is external to you. It is separate from you. Everybody who is sitting around you is other to you because they are not a part of you, right? They have a distinct mind or a distinct soul, a distinct existence, whatever it is. Objects in this room are other to you because they're not a part 
of u. So we can say anything that is self is u. Anything that is other is not you. So even other people that you're in relationship with and you feel like you know well, you've grown together, they are still other to you because they are separate to you in some sense. And you're never going to know exactly what it's like to be them or what the world looks like through their eyes. Because you can't get inside their head, right? They have unique experience of the world that is impenetrable from where you're standing. Now, Arigarai notes in this chapter that when we're existing in this universe, there are a bunch of things that are other to us, other people, objects, buildings, books, whatever it is. Anything that is not a part of you is other. We recognize things that are other to us in our life through seeing them, through interacting with them, whatever it is. Origuri thinks there's something interesting and special going on through the activity of recognizing that which is other to you. She says, recognition of the other presumes distinction, presumes difference. The fact that you can recognize that there is something that is other to you presumes that there is something that is different between you and the thing that you are recognizing. Think about it like this. Stuff that's happening in your body, maybe even thoughts that are going through your head or feelings that you're having, they're not transparent to you all the time, right? Unless you're actively putting your attention on those things, right? Your heart is beating right now. You wouldn't know that. You wouldn't feel that unless you were to check in with yourself and be like, okay, I can feel it beating, right? You don't recognize these things because they're a part of you. They're going on just kind of doing their own thing because they're a part of you and you're familiar with that and you take that stuff for granted. But when we're in reality, when we're interacting with stuff, seeing things, communicating, we are recognizing things. What that means is we've already discovered, in some sense, that there is me and there's something that I'm recognizing that's not me. There's a distinction here. There's some sort of distance. Now, Origurai extends this idea that there's a distinction between you and the things that you recognize to other people. She says, the other, and what she means by the other in this context is other people, normally, the other is not reducible to our ways of understanding or viewing the world. Why? Well, because each person is unique. They have a unique mind. They have their own subjective experience. They have their own point of view of reality. They have their own location in space-time. Right? You and I don't occupy the same point in this room, the same place. And therefore, our perspectives of what this room looks like and what we feel and sense and see and smell are going to be different just in virtue of having a different place, a different perspective. Other people, she says, are transcendent to our ways of understanding and viewing the world and the categories that we impose on the world around us. People always have the capacity to surprise you. No matter what categories or labels or models that you try to use to understand other people and their behavior, those categories and labels and models are always going to fall short. 
because they're never going to encapsulate that person fully. I can say, you're a member of this race, or you're a member of this ethnicity, or you had this experience happen to you when you were a child, or you have blue eyes or green eyes, whatever it is. But none of those labels or categories capture you, right? Who you are extends beyond those labels and categories. You cannot be encapsulated by them. You cannot be fully known by any of the categories or words that I try to use to understand who or what you are. And the same thing is true of how you view other people. None of the categories or labels that you can use to place on someone encapsulates them or fully explains who they are. Because there's something about them, whatever you call it, their personhood or their mind or their soul, that resists categorization, that extends beyond the bounds of any models or numbers or boxes you try to place them in. right? And so what this implies is that we should be engaging with other people differently. All too often when we communicate with others, when we relate to others, we try to put them in certain boxes. We try to categorize them in certain ways because that's easier, right? But it doesn't actually tell us who they are ultimately, right? This has implications for how we should relate to other people. Arigurai thinks that this idea that people are transcendent implies that personal relations should not be understood as a knowing them, but as a moving towards them. We can never completely know another person because knowing implies understanding. Like, there's something, if I knew who you were, ultimately, I would have a complete understanding of who you are. But that's impossible to have. So we shouldn't conceive of personal relations as a knowing, as a kind of knowing. We should conceive of personal relations as a moving towards, as trying to get closer to their irreducible subjectivity. Obviously, this is going to have certain implications for how we act within our personal relationships with other people. Excuse me. I like to use this graph to help explain kind of what a rigor eye is saying here. Let's imagine we have, you know, some sort of x, y grid. Let's say we represent you with this line, okay? Let's say I'm in relationship with you. Some people think what that means is as we cultivate a more and more comfortable and intimate relationship, eventually I'll get to the point where we intersect. And I finally know you. I get you. I know what you're about. I understand you fully. This is not possible, a rigor I think. And this is not a helpful way of engaging in relationships with others. Instead of trying to intersect where you are, what I should be doing, what we should all be doing, is constantly moving towards you. And so our relationship will look more like an asymptote that approaches you infinitely, but never quite reaches you. Because there is no ultimate ability or capacity for us to reach each other because we're irreducibly transcendent beings. Your existence is different than mine. My existence is different than yours. I can never see the world exactly as you do. You can never see the world exactly as I do. We're stuck in our own bodies. 
This is the way to conceive of relationships. Not as a knowing or as a reaching or as a grasping. Does that make sense? And so, Arigurai thinks that this has direct implications for the kinds of language that we should use and for what our relationships should look like, especially our, our sex relationships or our interpersonal relationships, whatever you want to call them. Arigurai thinks that because we are gendered and sexed beings, and she's borrowing kind of from Hegelian philosophy here, she thinks that that fact alone means that we are incomplete from the get-go. But we are never going to be able to become complete by uniting ourselves with someone of a different gender or sex. That's not how we go about becoming fulfilled, complete human beings. Be becoming a fulfilled and complete human being, Arigurai thinks, means becoming the person that you are meant to be, filling up the concept of what it means to be you. It's a strange way of conceptualizing what it means to be a gendered and sexed being, but... Again, this is kind of relying on the weird philosophy of Hegel, so don't think too much into it. If you want another way of putting this in layman's terms, what it means to become a complete, fulfilled human being is not to find your meaning in somebody else. You are your own independent person. You are not going to fulfill your life's goal you're not going to become a complete, happy, fulfilled human being by trying to become one with another person. It's not a good way of going about your life, okay? You're never going to become synthesized with the opposite sex. And this is Hegelian because it's based on his idea of the dialectic, which we'll not get into now. But that doesn't mean that we eschew relationships with other people, though. Relationships are an integral part of our lives. We just shouldn't put all our eggs in the basket of finding our soulmate. Okay? Instead, we can and should communicate and relate to one another, but at the same time, learn and grow and become who we are capable and meant to be in our own independent existences. So you're having a lot of faces. Do you want to express some of the things that you're thinking or feeling here? I think the way she's talking about it is weird. And I, I can't tell, how do I put this? I cannot tell if it's good or not. Because like, <laughs> the way that she talks about like sex and gendered and like that the, the sexes are different, right? And, but like, what, can you like expand on what she means by that? Like what she. Wh which part? So, she argues that neither ma quote unquote males nor females are whole, right? Like that. That there's a. It's it's not right. Yeah. But does she mean like that because of like the boxes that sex puts us in? It's not just the boxes that were put in by the society in which we live. Subjective. It's in virtue okay. of being a particular thing in a universe that is trying to reach towards a universal. I see what so we are, we are all particular beings, but we have there's some sort of universal conception of what it means to be a human. We're constantly reaching towards actualizing that universal conception of what it means to be a human. But we're not going to get there. Because we, we are a particular thing in space-time. A universal thing, 
like let's say a truth or a mathematical proof or whatever it is, is true for all time, is lacking nothing, and never has anything detracted or added to it. But that's not what it means to live in our reality. Our bodies are constantly in flux. Our minds are constantly in flux. We are not a perfect representation or a, or a perfect actualization of anything universal. I kind of, okay. I think I hate it. <laughs> you think you hate it, really? I, think I hate it. Why? I, because realistically, like, it's just an implication that nobody can ever be whole completely on their own, and I don't like that idea. I don't like the idea that, like, somebody can't feel whole within themselves. Oh, no, she thinks that's what we're trying to... That, that, but that's not what she said. She's saying we're incomplete from the get-go because we're particular beings with a particular sex and a particular gender. I think that's stupid. Okay. <laughs> but what she is trying to advocate for here is don't try to find your meaning and fulfillment in another, although relationships are very useful and great, and you should be in them. You do need to go about finding your meaning and fulfillment in yourself. Right. That is the path. So, like, thought experiment thing, like, archetypal human. So, like, there is, like, like, like kind of like going back to, like, um, was it Plato who talked about, like, like, or what, what, what philosopher was it that talked about, like, the, uh, the fact that, like, there's a, like, there are things that are, like, the archetype that we are, like, based on, but we're not actually that. The Plato has his Plato. idea of the forms of which the everything forms. in existence is an imperfect reflection of the perfect form of the thing. And that's what yeah. this kind of reminded me of. And I, I like, I don't think, because, like, when she started, like, when you started talking about, like, sex and gender stuff, it was like, oh, that's a little, that's a little weird. What are we going to get into now? Like, right. is this, like, going to be, like, an essentialist kind of thing? But I, I don't think that's what, I think that... She is kind of a centralist. Okay. She okay. is kind of a centralist. I, I, don't, I don't want to be too bad. And there, there are progressive thinker, thinkers who think that her philosophy um, is transphobic because it's a centralist. Mm. See, that's where I was See, yeah, like, getting a little I, like, red flag. I don't think that that was like the what she was going for, but I right. think that you can interpret it that way. I also don't think that's what she's going for, but I do think you can interpret it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I she's primarily that, like, a feminist. And one of the things that she's very interested in, interested in is healing the divide between men and women. And one of the things that we need to do to do that is establish sex rights. Elaborate. Rights that <laughs> women have that, or females have, that males wouldn't have. Oh, that gets weird, because intersex people exist. And then it's like, all right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think yeah. that like, this is like... Primarily for the protection of females, not. I feel you know, like for... there's there's people that exist that couldn't couldn't find themselves in this mm. in in this like philosophy. I feel like they would feel othered by a something that you're supposed to like. If the whole point is like you're supposed to feel whole as yourself and like relationships are useful and like they're great, but you can find a wholeness within yourself. I think that this is creating like a like a segregated I, like idea. Okay. So you like the general idea, but the way that she's going about explicating that the is otherizing. The idea is fine. <laughs> like, it's fine. But, like, she definitely did, like, a poor approach to her, to what I think. And I also think that, like, that might have to do with when this was, when this yeah. happened, like, when this was made, like, when she put this out, I, which I don't know when that was. I think this book was written in the late 1900s. Right. Because I know she also wrote... She wrote a, a very, she wrote a, a, a few important um, feminist philosophy books about sex and relationships during this time. Okay. Like Speculum of the Other Woman is a very important work in the history of sex philosophy. Or the, Hobbes? Hobbes, we're talking about monarchies, but obviously you can still apply Hobbes' principles with the recognition that the monarchy sort of statute in it isn't applicable anymore. So I think that while there's flaws within it, if you take the general principle and kind of remove it from those gender terminologies, it's fine. 
Okay. Like I, like I understand what you're saying about like humans being like not like we all have our own like little genetic differences. We all like have our own little quirks and our own like there's no human that is like exactly the same. And that sex in a way is kind of like two separate categories of human in a way. I mean, yeah, it's like a, but at the same time, it's like she would say that. Yeah, she would say that. But like even then. I don't know. Let's, let's just keep going. <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. you'll like what she says in chapter 10 a little <laughs> bit better. Because this chapter has more to do with... Well, okay. Assuming that the general ideas behind this is true, what does that imply about how we should relate to other people and how we should communicate with them? Her basic point in this chapter is the idea that our current language and means of relating to one another are domineering, controlling, and possessive. There are tons of examples of this. Can anyone come up with an example? How is our language possessive or controlling? How is our means of relating to one another, even in personal relationships, possessive and controlling? We can talk about like a family member or something. You say my. My is like a sure. owning word. Like <laughs> right. my. It is mine. And it's like like she's my girlfriend. My my mom. My right. My dad. My brother. My sister. She belongs to me. Right. Nobody else can have her. <laughs> right. How about even the the phrase "I love you"? She thinks that phrase is problematic. What does that phrase imply? Somehow, you can be encapsulated with this word. That's not respective of your transcendence as a subjectivity wholly different from my own. Which is why she thinks that we should even change it from not I love you, but I love to you. Like, my love like, is going towards you. I cannot encapsulate you with my love. I cannot fully understand you with my love. I, she says, you are not the direct object of whatever utterance I'm making, nor are you an indirect object. I do not revolve around you as a planet revolves around the sun. We should say, I love to you instead. Is she married? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so important to ask. In any case, she thinks that you can come up with numerous examples of this, and she talks a lot about it in the text. She gives some, some examples. But she thinks that we need to change our language and we need to change our ways of relating to one another to respect the transcendence that we all have as unique beings with unique life experiences and unique existences. She says we must respect each other as transcendent and free, not attempting to dominate or own or control the other. He was never married. I just put that up too. <laughs> Servants. Well, she said herself she's... She's just mad because no one told her I love She talks about this on pages 109 and 110 in this book, if you have it in front of you. It's the start of chapter 10. I love to you. I love to you means I maintain a relation of indirection to you. 
I do not subjugate you or consume you. I respect you as irreducible. I hail you. In you, I hail. I praise you. In you, I praise. I give you thanks. To you, I give thanks for all kinds of things. I bless you for I speak to you, not just about something, but rather I speak to you. I tell you, not so much this or that, but rather I tell to you. The to, T-O, is the guarantor of indirection. The to prevents the relation of transitivity, bereft of the other's irreducibility and potential reciprocity. The two maintains intransitivity between persons, between the interpersonal question, speech or gift. I speak to you, I ask of you, I give to you, and not I give you to another. The two is the sign of non-immediacy, of mediation between us. There is a distance between us and everyone. Thus, it is not I order you or command you to do some particular thing, which could mean or imply I prescribe this for you, I subject you to these truths or to this order, whether these amount to a form of labor or to a form of human or divine pleasure, doesn't matter. Nor is it I seduce you to me, the you becoming what belongs to me. The I love to you becoming I love what belongs to me. It's not the right way to think. Any more than it is, I marry you in the sense that I am making you my wife or husband. That is, I take you. I am making you mine. Rather, it is, I hope to be attentive to you now and in the future. I ask you if I may stay with you. And I am faithful to you. The two is the site of non-reduction of the person to the object. I love you, I desire you, I take you, I seduce you, I order you, I instruct you, and so on, always risk annihilating the otherness of the other, of transforming him or her into my property, my object, of reducing him or her to what is mine into mine meaning what is already a part of my field of existential or material properties. The two is also the barrier against alienating the other's freedom in my subjectivity, my world, and my language. I love to you thus means I do not take you for a direct object, nor for an indirect object by revolving around you. It is rather around myself that I have to revolve in order to maintain the to you, thanks to the return to me. Not with my prey, you become mine, but with the intention of respecting my nature, my history, my intentionality, while also respecting yours. Hence, I do not return to me by way of, I wonder if I am loved. That would result from an introverted intentionality going toward the other so as to return ruminating, sadly and endlessly, over solipsistic questions, a sort of cultural cannibalism. The two is the guarantor of two intentionalities, mine and yours. In you, I love that which can correspond to my own intentionality and to yours. And so she's commenting here on why she thinks we should change our language of I love you to I love to you, right? The two, she says, is the guarantor of protecting our individual existences. Relationships are interesting because all too often we recognize that there are two parties, but in our way of communicating with and relating to other people, we try to collapse the two parties into one thing, right? You are my girlfriend. I consume you, right? You are a part of me or something. That is my husband. He is a part of me. He is not separate from me. 
But that way of communicating and relating does not admit that we are actually two separate people, that we are two separate beings that cannot be reduced, either by language or by relation. Love is a paradox. In love, two people become one relationship, yet remain two individuals. This sort of idea echoes not only the mystical, orthodox, Christian notion of love, but also the notion of love that is explicated by Eric Fromm, who we've also read in this class. Love is a force which both unites and separates at the same time. Any proper practice of love must not only unite or only separate, but it must do both. That is why we don't think love means consuming another person, right? That is also why we think love does not mean being completely indifferent to another person, right? Maintaining an intractable distance. Love must unite and separate at the same time in order for it to be proper. In love, there is unity and multiplicity at the same time, and these are held in a certain tension, a certain balance. We can and should make commitments to other people, but we can do so healthily without sacrificing who we are and what we want in the process. How do we do this? Well, maintaining our own individuality and making commitments to another person can be done in a healthy, functioning, and proper way by recognizing and respecting difference. If I love you, I do not force you to do something you don't want to do. If I properly love you, I don't make you play this video game that has me all jazzed. Okay? I don't make you listen to a piece of music that you're not interested in. Okay? I recognize that you are different from me, that you have different desires, different wishes, different goals, and I respect those desires, interests, and goals. I don't try to subsume you into me and into my way of life. In order to actually go about this, in order to fix our relationships and fix our ways of relating to one another, Arigurai thinks we need a feminist reform in how we use language and how we perceive sexuality in our culture. Because the way that we treat sex and the way that we perceive and talk about sex, according to a rigor eye, is all fucked up. Pun not intended. <laughs> we should not view sex merely as a reproductive act, 
or an activity to engage in in which there's someone who's always submitting and someone who's always dominating. That's not healthy. But rather, we can and should start viewing sex as a potential spiritual activity. Thinking, conceptualizing of sex as merely a reproductive activity places a certain box on people, right? Places a certain expectation on how people ought to interact with each other sexually. Rather, sex can be seen not only as a procreative act, but as an act in which people actually learn and grow towards one another, as a moving towards, right? not as something that should consume or does consume one of the parties. Not We shouldn't view sex as something that you, know, you just do in order to get your rocks off, right? That doesn't involve actually respecting the other person's needs and what the other person wants. I don't think a rigor I would be very ecstatic about a lot of hookup culture that we have nowadays. She probably doesn't see that as very respectful of the parties involved, unless, of course, they come to a certain agreement. But even then, she probably wouldn't be too happy with trying to normalize that way of viewing and treating sex. She thinks sex should be treated with care, seriously. She thinks that we should distance sex from connotations of animality and of subjection and dominance. Because viewing sex in this way and engaging of sex in this way threatens to reduce the other person, right? You reduce them to an animal, you reduce them to a set of biological drives, or you reduce them to someone who is going to do what you say, right? Who's going to follow your orders as if that's an appropriate way to treat another person. She thinks that the way that people are thinking of sex and engaging in it, at least during her time, involves a, an unjustifiable power imbalance and an expectation of a power imbalance that is not respective of the other person's being. And she says that we should establish sex rights. I don't have any good examples of what those might be. But it's a good idea to keep in the back of your head. A rigor I thinks ultimately that creating an ethic of love and acceptance needs to start with the most basic relation that undergirds human society. Can you guess what that basic relation is? How are we going to get ourselves socially out of this mess of controlling and dominating other people? Don't respect each other. Right. What primary relationship do we need to fix in order to make that more widespread? Maybe. Think of think of her being an essentialist. Oh. What? What do you think it is? No. I don't, I don't what, re 
relationship do we need to fix? I, I, I would want to want to say like just like the self and the other in general, but. but That's true, but. But. Is it men and women? It's men and women. Oh. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Creating an ethic of love and acceptance needs to start with the fundamental relationship unit that makes society possible. Because we can't procreate without males and females. So she says men and women. We need to fix fundamentally the relationships between males and females. She says She says that we need to fix this relationship these relationships between males and females because they're the starting point of the family at least historically the state and of society Oop. I'm just going to write W but you can the right woman, okay? I got ahead of myself. And then here is what she says about that. This is on pages 112 and 113 near the end of this chapter. These intentionalities cannot be reduced to one. It is not enough to look ahead in the same direction as St. Alfred says, or even to ally rather than abolish differences. Man and woman, faithful to their identity, do not have the same intentionality as they are not part of the same gender and do not occupy the same genealogical position. But they can make commitments to act together according to terms of agreement that render their intentionalities compatible. To build a culture of sexuality together, for example, or to construct a politics of difference. In realizing our intentionality, each one of us can find support from alliances such as these. And so, you do not know me, but you know something of my appearance. You can also perceive the directions and dimensions of my intentionality. You cannot know who I am, but you can help me to be by perceiving that in me which escapes me, my fidelity or infidelity to myself. In this way, you can help me get away from inertia, tautology, repetition, or even from errancy, from error. You can help me become while remaining myself. Nothing here then suggests marriage through a contract that snatches me away from one family to chain me to another. Nothing subjects me like a disciple to a master. Nothing takes away my virginity or halts my becoming within submission to another, supported by an other or the state. Nor is there anything to force my nature to reproduce. What we are dealing with, rather, is a new stage in my existence, one enabling me to accomplish my gender in a specific identity related to my history and to a period of history. For the generic universal is not trans-historical. It is to be hoped that it will be realized progressively and, by extension, that this occurs throughout the world. It is now possible for the culture of sexual difference to spread throughout different peoples and traditions. Such an extension should be accompanied by qualitative progress, 
by progressive distancing from animality and from the subjection of sexuality to reproduction or pornography. The progress needs language. Not just the language of information, but as I've suggested, the language of communication too. What we particularly need is a syntax of communication. For communication amounts to establishing links, and that is a matter for syntax. And then she will go on in the next chapter to help establish what a proper communication looks like that does not reduce the transcendence of another person, that respects their intentionality. So, I get the sense that there are some things you dislike about what she is saying, but I also get the sense that there are some things that you think are good about what she is saying. So what do you think of her philosophy here? You don't like it? I said oi. Oi! <laughs> do you um, want to expand upon that? It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, like, at its core, she's got a good idea, I think. But like, oh my god, outside of that, she did it horribly, I think. <laughs> okay. Like, I, I hate how heteronormative it is. I feel like, and I know that maybe this is a little bit like, more of like a personal thing, but I don't need somebody to change the way they talk to me to know I don't belong to them. I don't mm. need, I don't, I, it's established in my relationship that we understand that like, there's no ownership over one another. Like, like, I don't, I don't need somebody to change the way that they like, speak to know that like, I'm not a, like an object of like for them right. or like or like vice versa like I'm it should be understood I think that people don't belong to one another you know what I mean like I don't right now I see what you're saying and I um, understand that like our society sucks and a lot of times like there is there are people that like think that they own like the women that they're with or like things like that but like I think that that's like a fundamental issue and like we can't just like change the way we talk and like right. fix like that as like a whole society issue. Right. I I think she would also say she doesn't need somebody to alter their language to know where she stands with them. I think what she's envisioning though is that if we want to change norms and behaviors, we need to change our terms of communication. And so she sees language as a vehicle for changing society. Not that it's a necessity, but that it's a path that we can take and that we're not utilizing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just... Maybe she's putting too much emphasis on language, though. Yeah, I think that it, I think it's a lot deeper of an issue than just, like, the way we talk. She thinks it is, too, yeah. And I think that, like... I think that, like, maybe that, maybe that could be a piece of it, but I think that if you focus on that so much, like, it's not you're not getting at what's important, which is the fact that people think that they own people ever, mm -hmm. regardless of the way that they talk to them. Yeah. And I also think that like, everything else she said is so incredibly heteronormative that it makes me want to like throw up. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. Like, being like, the, the basic relationship of society is man to woman, weird, weird and not true. Like, like, men, men and women obviously, like, in like a heteronormative aspect like that's like like what a relationship is right and like that's like the start of a family and like all like that shit but like that's just like like the the fact that you think that that's like a basic society relationship still isn't true because a lot of people have friendships that are just as important to them or other people around them that are just as important to them that are the same like sex or gender as them and i think that like baselining like man to woman like as like the, the society relationship is just so weird and and not not true so that there are two claims that we can differentiate here there's the idea that there's the basic 
what you might call evolutionary truth, that for hundreds of millions of years, all of our ancestors have been male and female. So there's the idea that society depends on procreation, and therefore depends on the relationships between males and females. But then you can go further, and you can say, well, the basic relation of society is man to woman. And then you can even take it a step further, and you can say the basic relation in society should be between men and women. Now, I think a rigor eye goes all the way, personally. Yeah. I think you need to stop at the top one. Yeah, number one is like, yeah, because you do need, I egg. guess. You need eggs and sperm to make a, a baby. And babies is how humans are born. And until we can figure out a new way to do that. We have. We well, do, <laughs> but until that's like standardized and everyone can just right. be like, baby, and then maybe right. a baby comes out. Right? <laughs> By pressing a button, yeah. Yeah, they're making it, and then a baby yeah. comes out. You want to make a baby? Yeah. Boop. <laughs> oh my god, that'd be so much That'd be easier. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, but I think you you y'all have problems with her going to three, right? I have a oh, problem yeah. with her going to two, let alone going to three. Because but. to say that like okay, I think to say that so the, this is I will say this is normative. Yeah. Right. This is this is still descriptive. Yes. So is it? Are you? Do you think she's wrong in saying that? Maybe a mischaracterization. It's uh, like the most fundamental and or widespread relationship in I society? I don't think, re define relation, because relation relationships aren't always like a sexual or a romantic relationship. Relationships are, are like much broader than that. True. So I yeah. guess it depends on what you mean. Because like obviously like, like cis-het relationships are the most common relationships. That doesn't mean that they're most that they're the most important necessarily, or right. that they're the most like. Or that like, they should be prized or, right. necessarily. Or... Right, but also like that's not if like it depends on what she means by relationship, I guess. Because if you're saying that's the basic relationship of a society, I think I think that that's wrong unless they're talking okay. about specifically like sexual and romantic relationships. I took it as she was talking about just like a relation as in an interaction between two people. Right. Mm. I think that that is the most basic relationship of or rela relation. So you 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 think just one and two are two right? Numbers are true. Like numerically, there's going to be more people who identify as males and people who identify as females interacting with each other on a day to day basis than people who are non-binary or otherwise non-gendered. See, that's not what I mean. I mean like I mean like mm -hmm. women and women interacting. Like, if we're still, like, I do, like, obviously, like, oh, that's true. That's I didn't what, think about that. Yeah, like, obviously, I, I agree with you, like, that there are more people that identify as man or woman than, like, outside of that. But I mean, like, I mean, like, women to women, that's the same ratio as, like, a woman to a man or a man to a man. Mm. I feel like that, like, those shouldn't, like, that's not a basic, like, I don't think that, like, man to woman is the, the basic relation. I think if we need to break it down within binary and be man and man, women and women, men and women. Okay. I agree. Yeah, yeah, maybe you disagree with too. I didn't think that. Yeah. Oh, what are you thinking? What am I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> so like, again, like one is just like kind of correct in a way, but like the way you say that is like, you can say that society you can say that the human race depends on procreation to continue, but like the implications that you draw from that, like to say that that is like a moral good, or to say that that mm -hmm. is the way sh things should be, or that like people have to, like people have to be in like even she says like right that like sex shouldn't be for procreation. It should not be conceptualized just as procreation. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So then, what makes hetero 
like relationships the building block of society because hetero relationships are kind of like the way she's defining the worth of it is almost like dependent on the fact that it mm. produces procreation mm -hmm. right like she's defining the worth of it within society based on the procreation of it but she doesn't want you to think that sex is about procreation and also like the whole like taking people out of boxes thing but keeping them inside the largest boxes of all which are man and woman and like the fact that like that that creates a wall that that creates the like mm. the biggest wall of all the, like the wall between like our societal views of men and women for a lot of people some people can you know get out of that but like i think when she says men and women what she means behind it is males and females yeah. which is but yeah. it's it's still not clear right so this work was translated from french okay. there mm. might be and french is a very gendered language it's very Right, French right. Is, like, French is like a really heteronormative culture, let alone like like language. Yeah. Like it's literally like every noun has a gender. Yeah. And right. that's weird. But I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what her attitudes are about um, heteronormativity, because I'm not sure if she was straight. True. Oh she, was, she was the second wave, right? Like, um, the third lover? wave. Huh? She have a lover? I don't. I don't know. I don't know that much about I'm her sure personal she, life. I'm sure she. Um, I'm, I'm sure, sure she. Doubted. You know, she had relationships. Um, I don't. I don't want to be too bad for it. <laughs> but, yeah. So it's. Yeah, it's a question there. There's because, some ambiguity here. And, and like the I love to you thing. I've never ever ever conceptualized, like, that as anything else. I've always conceptualized love as like giving love to someone else. Okay. I've never ever like thought of it as like how she was describing it. And that's when I'm like, is is it me, or like, or is this like how everyone, or is it like only certain people conceptualize it in that way? Is it really? Well, and, and then is it an issue with like the patriarchy itself? Because like, I think only like certain t people will like conceptualize "I love you" as like a claiming thing. I, well, have you ever used that phrase in a way that is domineering or controlling in any one of your relationships? I just want my love to hit somebody like a tree. Like, have you ever have you ever broken up with someone? Yeah. Or have they yeah. broken up with you? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had somebody break up with you? But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever say to them, "But I love you"? Yeah. No, because I'm not manipulative. No. <laughs> no. I went. Damn. No. All right. I think that's pretty common, right? Saying "But I love you" or saying like like as if that's a reason for them to stay, as if you're trying to persuade well, no, them. No. I I I could be like, "I love you," but I understand like why this is happening and like I can I can <laughs> respect like the decision that you're making but I'm not going to be like but I love you you have to stay that's fucking crazy <laughs> like don't do that we're not like you're crazy uh, it's a little uh, ch childish I guess not it's, childish but like, like oh, I think maybe. it depends on the context of whether it's crazy or whether it's just like immature and like a stupid thing I think to that say. yeah the person but like, yeah. like you're a little you know you've all had probably experiences though in which somebody has said this to you in a way that was controlling. But that's a them problem. Yeah. yeah. I guess you could say like parents do that sometimes. Oh, right. Yeah. I love you, so you're not going out after nine. And it's like, I right? Love you too, but I'm still But if you really you pushed your love towards me, like if you love, like if you're not like, it's not like a love, it's like a love, you know? Like that's right. how I always conceptualize it. Maybe that's just because I have great parents. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe but I just don't have trauma. It's kind of like what I was saying is like the language isn't the defining issue. Here. It's the right. You the language is just reflective of what people believe, and and I right? think that like I think that there's a way to say I love you instead of I love to you, and still articulate that like what you mean is I'm loving towards you, and I and I sure. I love towards you, and like that's why I'm like doing these things and caring about you and saying these things, but I don't mean that as like I love you, you have to do what I want. Right. Do you do you agree with her? aims in trying to change the language though like do you do you think like the goal yeah do you think like her intention is good and that she's like look relationships are messed up there's some fixing we can do here pornography portrays women badly oppresses them True. relationships a lot of them are domineering and possessive True. bad for women bad for a lot of men too True. The language that we use, domineering and controlling. 
Do you agree with her sense of that? I think, like, she really is trying to make good points here. Except, like, I think it gets, like, really... She tries to make, yeah. Like, it gets kind of, like, muddy at places. Which, I, I don't know if I can blame her just yet, because I don't really know her that well. <laughs> but I just feel like, like, especially in the very beginning, we were talking about, um, like, being whole and whatnot, and not needing a relationship to make you feel whole. You should be able to do that yourself. And then be able to, like, essentially coexist with whoever partner that you want to coexist with without having to be one. Like, mm -hmm. yes, but I feel like that's kind of, I feel like we all, if we have common sense, kind of know that. Like, even this, I feel like it's something that we know but don't say. So I feel like maybe the issue here is, like, trying to actually put this idea into words, and that's where the mistranslation starts to happen. Because, I don't know, I just mm. feel like if anybody was going to get into a relationship, I think they know, okay, well, I'm me, and you're you, but we're coexisting together because we like each other. You know what I mean? So if we do do things as one, we still are separate beings, but we're choosing to be a team. Mm -hmm. No one's thinking that like, oh, well, when I like start dating this person, like, oh, we're just one now, and I don't have any like individuality anymore. Like we we kind of like internally aware of like the difference. Yeah, I mean, I don't think people go into relationships often wanting to be consumed by the other person, right? But the way that we think and act often is consuming. Is it not? Or if you don't want to say that about yourself, you can probably say that about people you know. Can be. I don't think we need for it to be though. That's right. A lot of times we don't. But not meaning to doesn't change the fact that people are hurting people. And I think that people need right. to be proactive about that, and like, and like they need to present that to people and like understand like like. I might say and do these things, and I want you to, to tell me when it when it comes across to you that way, like when it comes across to you as like an ownership or like as like a possessive like thing that I'm saying or doing, mm -hmm. point that out and like and like and if it, it's a way of like thinking that it needs to be altered, like and like, but how if since it's so ingrained in us, if it's not pointed out directly, then how is it ever going to be challenged? Right. And it's funny because a lot of the times when we're in relationships with people, there are things that we do not say because we don't want to hurt them or hurt their feelings. But in a way, there's something narcissistic about that insofar as you don't want to hurt their feelings because that hurts you. Mm -hmm. True. Which is an interesting thing. Do you have any comments on this? <laughs> any thoughts? <laughs> um, you don't have to say anything. I kind of like it. Okay. Um, I kind of like it. I think the language thing is more like her pointing out what's already embedded in our culture that like we don't mean to do it and like we didn't create these things, but like you have to realize like the people who did create it, like that was their intention. You know what I mean? Like it's good that we can realize that's not what we want and like we have progressed as a society. But it wasn't always like that. It was about control, like, for a long sure. time, you know what I mean? Like, it is good that it's not normalized as much anymore, but it definitely was. And, like, I do agree with her, like, idea of becoming whole within yourself and, like, not trying to fulfill yourself with a relationship. And, like, I feel that, um, like, her gender views are very, like, a little wonky, but I think, like, you just have to try to focus on the actual thing. Like, I feel like she's very old. Which doesn't doesn't yeah. make it. She's okay. very old. You know, it doesn't make it right. But also, she's not living in the time that we are. She doesn't have the knowledge that we do. And right. like, for her time to like realize that you have to like focus on yourself, and that comes within, and like you can't you can't own anyone else. Like I agree with that. Like I think it's a good idea of wording it. I just think. It's not very 2022, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sure. It's, it's, it's take a little class, but like... I think like fundamentally I understand and agree with her, but like the way that she's that she's like branching from the idea is like where the issue is. Mm. Okay, yeah. And she's coming from like Hegel, right? Yes. So like she sees like a dialectic between men and women in a way, right? Yep. And but that like, but like again, she says that like Individual. She is trying to break away from Hegel's idea that love is an uh, is an aspect of labor for the uh, 
sublation of a child. Which, yeah. which is what Hegel yeah, believed. He was weird and he's that. like, nah, we're, she's like, we're not having that. Okay? Yeah. Love is not just about having children. Okay. Okay, so she says, so okay, dialectic between men and women. First of all, so if humans are individuals, which she says so, and they all have their own, they're all transcendent, and you cannot, like, put them in a box. Right. But then she also says that males and females are different and can also be put in boxes because they are male and female. I think to a certain extent. To a yeah. Certain, yeah, to a certain extent. They're, they are, it's like they're within a category. You might not be a box, it might be circles, but like they might be like within like... Yeah, they might be maybe they're infinite circles or something, yeah, <laughs> you know? But like, I'm, like the way I've always understood like the dialectic or like, you know, stuff like that is that it's, they kind of have to be well-defined and have like certain aspects that are like constant throughout like their entire like existence, right? So like a, like a woman is such a vague term. Like even like, okay, we say like woman as a sex, not woman as a gender, right? Woman has like a sex, as in like the parts, right? Whatever we want to say. But like each woman has their own individual like view of the world, their own mind, their own body, their own like, and they're like, they're not, every, every, okay, every man as well, right? Every, if, you want, if we're talking about sex specifically, not gender, right? Um, each one of these people has their own like biological makeup, chemistry, like their bodies aren't the exact same, even though they might follow a similar archetype, you could say, but like even then they're like different, right? Every person is completely different in their own little way, right? And she acknowledges that when she says people are transcendent, you cannot know a person wholly, right? And then we, but then she turns around and begins to talk about women and men as if they're like two forces that are like in contradiction with each other and they need to sort out their differences. Like, and like, it's very, are you trying, you can explain Hegel? I, I'm just dialectic. putting on how I see their, um, their, their differing views and relationships, but keep going, yeah. But yeah, like, I don't think that, I think that she is blinded by her era and her, um, let's say, time in history and her perspective, because I see an inherent contradiction within her, like, discussing of, of men and women as separate things and inherently different, but also simultaneously being individuals with a complete unique experience. And I don't see how you can get rid of those two things. Like, how you can, um, what's the word? Resolve them. Right, I think... Because she is Hegelian, part of her essentialism does commit her, I think, to a view that is kind of cis-heteronormative, right, as you've been saying. Now, Hegel thought that basically love was a relationship for the goal of producing a child. Now, I think we can modify what Arigurai is saying here in that it's unclear exactly whether or not she's conceiving of this relationship in purely male or female terms, or if she's conceiving it in terms of individual terms, as individual people, mm -hmm. right? Because she doesn't think the goal of a relationship should be a child, but she does think that through relationships, we become better versions of ourselves. We come into who we are more fully through a relationship. But it's unclear if, if her essentialist view commits her to, well, certain norms around what relationships should look like and who should be parts of these relationships, you know? Which is why I put male and female in question mark here, because I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't read her fully enough. Um, but as has been stated before, um, trans is not on her radar. I would be. I would assume. So. I, would assume <laughs> I would also assume that she might be a little 
little weary of that. <laughs> Maybe. Might yeah, she might be. It might depend on why someone transitions for her. Weird. <laughs> well, for example, if I transitioned because I wanted to, I don't know, take advantage of some system or opportunity, you would say that that's not a legitimate reason, right, to transition. But nobody does that. Right, but it, yeah. you can imagine. Like, like, oh. Hypothetically, you'd be like, that's not legit. Oh, like, you're yeah, not trans. Like, but, uh, that's a lot of, like, time and money and, like, and, like, a lot of, like, oppression you're putting yourself through for, like, not much, like, of an outcome. Yeah, I think that's just... Because, yeah. you know, we, like, go through philosophers and we're like, oh, now that they, like... Identify the problem. What's like the plan of action? What's her plan of action for like fixing our language? Since she just said like, oh, we have a problem. Just do it. We should okay. fix it. Like, we start we changing it. language in our own personal lives. Perhaps we start baking in different language um, strategies into education. Perhaps we change the language of the laws that we have, of how we conceptualize rights. She thinks that we need to add new rights to our social contract. I'm not exactly sure what those yeah, look like. Which is like that's weird. Like, does she mean like specifically like a right to birth control for people with like I don't uteruses? Know. Maybe like maybe, that's like a thing. Maybe. She would say no, females, like but like you know, maybe like a right to birth control or right to like an abortion. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure. I'm on. Like, yeah, I sure. Can't comment like, on it. <laughs> but like, it shouldn't be like a females have a right to an abortion. It should be like humans have a right to an abortion. Right? Like, it's like a human thing. Like, what are we like? Come on, don't put people in a box. Like, what are you doing? Like, stop. Like, it's like, you don't like boxes, but you're putting them in. Oh, it's, she's wrong. She's old. <laughs> I, think I feel so like I'm arguing with my grandma. I think, that, like, I think her time's limiting her a lot. Like, the whole, like, need, like, opposite sex roles. I feel like that's literally just going against the fact that, like, there were so many, like, rules that women couldn't do that she's like, yeah. well, now there needs to be a rule that men can't do it, and this is something that women can do because we didn't mm. get it for so long. I but think that, like, depending on when so this yeah. was, like, written, this could have been progressive, it you know what I mean? Well, yeah. Oh, it definitely was yeah, when it was, was right. for sure. But yeah. I also think that, like... You're allowed to move on. You're al <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to look at something that was once progressive and be like, oh, that kind of sucked. <laughs> like, that kind of was not great, and we can update that. Yeah. Well, yeah, but even, like, between when she wrote this and, like, obviously we're now learning about it, we've changed so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drastically. Yeah. So, like, if she was even more modern and wrote it today, it would look vastly different. True. And it probably yeah. would still have the same core values, but obviously be written in a way that was less gendered. Yeah. Mm. yeah okay. I think she's probably pretty cool. Probably it looks like it was originally yeah. published in 1990. Ooh. And she that. is operating within a different culture. Yeah, I'm gonna give her a bad. A very heavily. So I think she kind of has it. I, yeah. I think that I need to talk to her now because she's, <laughs> so she's 92. <laughs> I don't know what it takes. Maybe you can reach out. Email her.